In this lesson, we're going to look at photosynthesis, and then we're going to look at comparing that to respiration, and how does a leaf kind of accomplish photosynthesis. So let's start with the who of photosynthesis. It's not listed on this slide, but the who of photosynthesis is plants, obviously. But also, don't forget that algae do photosynthesis. Those are single-celled little organisms that live in water. And some bacteria do photosynthesis. The where is the chloroplast. Okay, so it's done in the chloroplast of plants. But again, plants, algae, and some bacteria. And what does photosynthesis do? Photosynthesis is done so that you can make this sugar, C6H12O6. That's glucose, okay? And again, that's the main purpose of photosynthesis. And the overall reaction is here at the bottom. So this is the overall reaction right here. Um, in terms of what you need, remember the reactants are what goes into photosynthesis. So our reactants for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water. And in the presence of light and chlorophyll, these will get converted to glucose and oxygen gas. And remember that oxygen gas for this product is a waste. Um, so why are the light and chlorophyll over the arrow? Um, the reason is that they are necessary to re make this reaction go. You can think of them as catalyzing this reaction. But as this reaction goes from reactants toward products, the amount of these two things, carbon dioxide and water, will decrease because these atoms will get rearranged to become these molecules right here. So the reactants will decrease, the products will increase as a result. In other words, you're consuming these, okay? Light and chlorophyll are not consumed by the reaction. They're necessary to make it go, but they don't get consumed by the reaction. All right, now in terms of what's gonna influence the rate of photosynthesis, um, a couple things will influence the rate. One of those things is amount of reactants, right? If you deprive a plant of, say, carbon dioxide, they're going to do less photosynthesis because they have a little less of the, the things that they need to get photosynthesis started. Um, less light, that's going to be a problem, okay? So if you don't provide the plant enough light, then photosynthesis is going to slow down and stop. Also something called transpiration, and transpiration is one of those shuns from the water cycle, right? That's where the plant loses water um, from the leaves at the stomates. Um, this, can, this can actually impact photosynthesis. You can lose a lot of water through transpiration, which can slow photosynthesis. However, usually those stomates are open during the day, so mm -hmm. you can... You can um, get water vapor in or bring water up from the roots to replace um, anything that's lost um, at the, the level of the leaf through transpiration. So transpiration can have some impact, but it may not always have a very large impact. All right, I wanted to take a minute and just go through this um, classic EOC scenario with you. So you've got a light shining on a fish tank. And in this fish tank, which is full of water, you've got a water plant with these little tiny bubbles forming on the surface of the plant. And the classic EOC question is, what's in those bubbles? Well, remember, if this is the product of photosynthesis, then what's in those bubbles is the gaseous byproduct of photosynthesis. Well, what gas does photosynthesis produce? It produces oxygen. So uh, if you're asked that kind of question on a uh, test, that's what you're looking for. All right, so let's compare this and look at photosynthesis and respiration now. Um, we're going to kind of come full circle now between photosynthesis and respiration. Um, on your notes sheet um, is a diagram kind of like this. I did not draw this diagram, but it's, it's very similar to one that I drew for you on the respiration sheet um, where we were looking at what's the overall relationship between plants and animals because of photosynthesis and respiration. So if we start here, plants will take in carbon dioxide, right? Um, and they can take in water. 
and they will release C6H1206. That is the food um, that animals will eat. But also don't forget, plants can consume their own glucose, right? So they can actually produce food for other organisms, but they also produce their own food. Um, and animals then would consume this, um, this glucose and they release more carbon dioxide into the air. Okay, so that kind of fuels plants. Don't forget also as a result of cellular or of, of photosynthesis, free oxygen goes out into the air and that free oxygen is taken up by animals and used for respiration. Um, that free oxygen can also be used back by the plant to do um, cellular respiration because remember the plant also does cellular respiration. So that's kind of how you get this little mini cycle between carbon dioxide and oxygen in the atmosphere through photosynthesis and respiration as part of the carbon cycle. Um, but you also get this exchange of uh, food between plants and animals or plants and themselves. Also, though, if you look at the two equations, this top one is cellular respiration from the other presentation. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 is going to yield carbon dioxide and water plus ATP in the form of energy. Compare that to the photosynthesis equation from the other slide. Carbon dioxide, water, in the presence of light and chlorophyll, will form C6H12O6 plus 6O2. If you look at it, notice that these things came from there and these things came from here. In other words, these equations are basically just the opposite of one another. So they're the same in reverse and you would, to, to convert one to the other, you would take this respiration equation, flip it around and take off the ATP and then add light and chlorophyll over the arrow and you've got photosynthesis. If you take the light and chlorophyll off the arrow and flip this equation and add ATP, you've got respiration. So the equations are kind of reverse or opposite one another. All right, so let's look at now the structure of a leaf and how it is if you were looking at a cross section, meaning you cut a leaf and you picked it up and you looked at the cut side. That's what this is kind of what you would see under a microscope. Um, and what I want to do is remember that that leaves are primarily responsible for photosynthesis. So in reality, any green part of a plant can do photosynthesis, but the leaf is going to do the majority of photosynthesis. Um, so you'll, you'll see um, a waxy cutin, which is a coating on the leaf, and it's up top and it's underneath. Um, it's this very topmost layer. Um, this is for waterproofing. It's not so much for keeping excess water out, but remember the leaf needs water inside of it, so it's, you're going to prevent water loss here. In addition to that waxy coating, you have this layer called the upper epidermis, and then you have this lower epidermis on the undersurface of the leaf. That's there as another layer of protection. It kind of works for waterproofing, but also protection from predators. So, uh, you know, bugs that eat leaves and so on. Um, they, you know, these, the waxy coating and the, this primary layer that you get here, those are going to kind of just protect the inner workings of the leaf because it's in here, this area, this area that's called the mesophyll or middle layers where you're going to see photosynthesis occurring, okay? Now, the, uh, it's important to note that the epidermal cells are clear, too. This picture doesn't show that, but the epidermal cells are clear. So both of these layers are clear so that sunlight, as it strikes the leaf, can strike the next layer, which is the palisade layer. You'll notice the palisade cells are tightly packed together, um, and they are green for, for doing a maximum amount of photosynthesis. So the palisade layer is where most of photosynthesis takes place. And I'm, I don't have my stylus today. I apologize for the handwriting here. Um, the next layer underneath that is called the spongy layer because it's full of holes. Okay, so this is not as tightly packed. The leaves here are the, excuse me, the cells here are still green so that if any light sneaks past the palisade, the spongy cells will pick it up and continue to do photosynthesis here. But you've got these air spaces in here. And air spaces are great for holding two things, water vapor and carbon dioxide. 
right? And the spongy layer you'll notice is open to the outside through these stomates or stomata, and we'll talk about those in just a second. So water vapor and carbon dioxide can be brought in. So remember, what you need for photosynthesis is carbon dioxide and water, and then you need light and you need chlorophyll. So the leaf has brought all of those things in. The light comes through the first layers. The second, the mesophyll is all green with chlorophyll. You've got space for water vapor and carbon dioxide. You've brought everything you need for photosynthesis into this one-stop shop here, this one location. If you don't get enough water uh, stored in the spongy layer, there's a vascular bundle here. That vascular bundle contains a series of tubes um, that um, we usually call that a vein, by the way, the leaf uh, vein, um, that can bring water up from the roots. And also some of this, this tissue here will take the sugars that you made and, and produce it. You'll send it back down to the rest of the plant in sap. Um, so really, you've got everything you need for photosynthesis in one place. Now, it's not always a good scenario to have the leaf completely open like you're seeing here. Um, so what you're seeing, these stomates or stomata are um, openings on the undersurface of the leaf. For transpiration, um, they can kind of act like pressure valves because as sunlight strikes the leaf, the leaf will heat up. Um, and you need to be able to release some of the gas pressure from the leaf, but also allow some carbon dioxide to get into the leaf. Um, so the, the stomates don't always stay open. They are protected by these guard cells. Um, and if you look at the picture here, you can see the function of these guard cells. Um, you can imagine these like two little water balloons that are attached at top and at bottom. So at top here and then at bottom. When they fill up, um, what you get is these cells will plump up, and as they plump up, because they're attached at top and bottom, they open this little hole between them. That's the stomate there. So when the plant is full of water and it's got good turgor pressure, this, these guard cells will plump up and open the stomates. As the plant starts to go under water stress, the guard cells will lose water, and as they lose water, um, they will kind of squeeze back together and close that stomate between them. So that's how they kind of function. So they're, as the plant gains and loses water, they will open and close the stomate um, respectively, just depending on, on what's needed at the time.